How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tier Talk. Guys, we're going to have a great dialogue. It's going to be about issuing food trays to the inmate population. If you guys get a chance, I want you to check out William Young's video. He has a YouTube channel called Just Corrections. He just did a video, great video on, you know, issuing trays to the inmate population, things that we need to be, you know, wary of. We, we need to make sure that we are doing this by procedure. And I was like, you know what? This is a great discussion. I spoke to Will to ask Will if he would mind if I continue a little bit the discussion on our channel. I think it's a great topic, and I wanted to have Russ to come in. And Will, of course, was all for that. Will couldn't be on today, or else he would be. Uh, but we will be collaborating again very soon. But again, today's show is going to be about issuing food trays to inmates. We're going to be quick. Just going to list out a few tips uh, that I think matter. Now, mind you guys, this isn't all inclusive. Because again, guys, uh, you know, there's going to be many ways inmates can try to manipulate contraband through those food trays. But we're going to give you some ideas that I think will help you along the way. Um, but I wish this was a catch-all, and it's not. Uh, no catch-all here. Again, the more we present obstacles, the more they become innovative. So again, this is just basically giving some good advice in the effort that at least we could slow it down. And my guest today is going to be Russ Hamilton. But before we bring on Russ, I just want to announce our sponsors. Uh, the first sponsor we got is American Military University. Guys, if you're looking to get a degree, seek higher education, please check out American Military University. It's a great school, great online college. And the cool thing about American Military University, guys, is that they're very supportive of what we do in corrections. They're very supportive of this channel on Tear Talk. They've been with me since the very, very beginning. And we also have Guardian RFID from inmate tracking and cell checks to cloud-based business and artificial intelligence. Guardian RFID digitally transforms jails, prisons, and juvenile detention facilities of every size. Visit guardianrfid.com for more information. And guys, don't forget, we got two books on the market right now, Inmate Manipulation Decoded. It's a good book for training. You can see the cover there in the back as well. Uh, if you guys are looking for uh, some books on inmate manipulation, this book has done very well uh, for us in the corrections field. So please check it out. Uh, the link to that is in the description. And we also have Lessons Learned While Working in Prison, My Journey from Officer to Administration. This book is a collection of tips uh, and advice. I mean, that really just comes from a bunch of people that have walked the walk. And then, guys, this is really if you're going to step it up a notch. I wish I had this book with me when I started the profession. But I share a lot of insight, and it will help you grow in this profession. And again, it's not just something from me. It's got... 159 tips from people from all walks of the corrections profession. So I think it's a really good read and it's also interactive. Each passage has a spot where you can add a thought. And then when it's completed, maybe you can pass your book off to someone else that you feel has the greatest potential. So now once he gets back in screen, there he is. I got a little nervous, but let's get Russ in. Russ, what's up, brother? Hey, Anthony, how's it going tonight? Good, Russ. Hey, Russ, you mind introducing yourself to our audience again? Uh, no, not at all. My name is Russ Hamilton. I am a former and retired sergeant with California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I am also a former senior juvenile correctional officer, and currently I work for a private company where we do reentry and rehabilitation work um, at a local county jail and a local county probation department where I serve as the person who's the case manager for the jail. And Russ, Housekeepers of Chaos on Facebook. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, we've had uh, really kind of an interesting weekend. Big shout out uh, to those individuals that work out there at Pontiac uh, Correctional Center in Illinois. They had a very serious incident out there the other day. They had uh, a sergeant get stabbed in the neck and uh, an officer was also stabbed, I believe. Um, the sergeant was in uh, critical condition. He got out of the hospital today, so I'm happy to announce that. Uh, we did a little blurb on it um, the other day, or I think it was yesterday, uh, where we talked about, you know, inmates making weapons out of those tablets that they are sometimes given. Yes, guys, and uh, if you get a chance, please check it out. It's on the Tear Talk Shorts. Again, these are things that are given to the inmates that if we can't stop them from getting it, we should at least be cognizant. Uh, of some of the dangers that they uh, could present. And in this case here, that video that Russ did uh, was based on information that was sent our way that really was very helpful. So we make sure that this doesn't happen again. And um, 
again, hearts and, and prayers are going out to Pontiac. Now, Russ, I, I thought of this topic after I saw William Young's video. I thought it's a great video. Again, you guys get a chance to check out Just Corrections, a good channel for, for uh, information about corrections. But again, it's a good video about issuing food trays. So we have a few tips we want to provide now. Uh, but let me go over something real quick. Now, trays are going to be delivered. Obviously, it's what we do. Um, whether they're going to be in full min units, open dorms, or max areas. Um, I would like to think um, that we have more control of the issuing of trays in more close custody units, which is great. Don't get me wrong, that's good. But we also have to be cognizant of those um, full min areas as well, because again, it's a more open environment. And even if we were controlled in our methods to handing out the trays, uh, you still have inmates that have a lot more freedom there that could pass around trays and whatnot. So I just want to make sure that when we're having this dialogue, uh, people are wary that no matter what we discuss here, nothing here is 100%. It's just to create the right momentum. Now, let's talk about the first bit right off the bat. Um, sometimes when we issue trays, we either are the ones issuing them ourselves. Custody will check the trays, do what they can, and issue them directly or it's done by porters or runners. Now, with that said, and I'll, I'll go to Russ real quick, but with that said, uh, we can't really eliminate in all facilities runners or porters delivering the trays because sometimes areas are too big. We don't have enough staffing. So there is some level of, uh, there is some level of reliance on having the porters do what they're directed to do. And we'll talk about how we can gauge some level of control over that, but Russ, what's your thoughts on us delivering the food or issuing the trays versus the porters or the runners issuing the tray, uh, trays? Yeah, in every spot where it's at all possible, um, I would prefer to see us or, or food staff or whatever handle everything, you know, all the way from the point where it's prepared all the way to the end to us passing it out. That's not always the way it is necessarily. Um, a lot of the places where I passed out food, you know, were, um, you know, uh, high security areas like the adjustment center at San Quentin, for instance, or death row. Uh, so those places, it's especially important, you know, to try and keep it, you know, as, uh, as, you know, secure and safe as possible. Um, in other units that I've seen and that I've worked in and stuff that were more general population units, um, it's maybe not as key to have all of those things, but you should still try and provide for a level of safety and security uh, because, you know, sooner or later, something will happen. What that thing's going to be, we never know ahead of time or they wouldn't need us to be there. Right. And, and guys, um, as I was talking to somebody before I did this video, um, I just want to mention that there are going to be some facilities where, like me and Russ said, you're going to have to have the porters be uh, deliver the food. So I want to talk about some systems um, that that should be in play. So um, when that happens, so Russ mentioned something very at the very beginning of the dialogue that I thought mattered is that when you have food leaving the production area, uh, get into the receiving area. So basically the unit in which the food has to be delivered, there should be a lot of checks and balances in between that. And what I mean by checks and balances is besides metal detectors and all this other stuff, just in case, but metal detectors really only catch what's metal. Um, you need different people checking that food in different areas of responsibility. So just to give you an example, if I'm the custody officer in the production area, I may partner with food service before those trays are leaving my area. Then when it goes through uh, different areas of the facility, when it goes into my area, let's say in the tide tour, just areas where we're going from, you know, one spot of the facility to the other, like the walk, the walkthrough, whatever you want to call it that each area it goes into, there should be another spot check. And you never avoid a metal detector. I don't care. You know, you, you never avoid the metal detector. If there's food that's going past the metal detector, push it through. And then once it gets to that receiving location, the officer, the custody person in that unit should be 100% uh, one of the last people that check that food before it goes out. They can't trust in all the fail safes we had prior because they are that last fail safe. So first, let's go over those systems, those checks and balances, Russ. So what are we looking at the moment it leaves the production area all the <clears> way to <throat> entering uh, the receiving spot? 
So first of all, you know, in your uh, production area, you know, you have to make sure that you have an accountability for all of the tools and things that are there. Um, there's always the potential for them to slip something inside one of the cabinets. Uh, some of these things are hot carts that are battery powered, or sometimes, you know, they just, you know, hold the heat inside. Uh, but one way or another, it's one of those things where if they put something inside there and they can get it out in between or hide it from the bottom, there's a potential that that tool is going to be, you know, cut up and used for weapons. Um, we see it time and time again. It happens all the time. So we have to make sure that there's not the opportunity for that particular container, whatever it is, to be contaminated uh, with some sort of tools, some sort of um you know, uh, you know, fashionable pieces of metal, whatever it is that's in that dining hall. We have to be careful that it's not in there. And we want to make sure that from one end to the other end, that nothing is introduced. So that's basically the way it is, the way we go about it, locking those things, inspecting those things, uh, running a mirror underneath, whatever we can do to stop it. The best thing that we can do to stop it, though, is not have those inmate porters pushing those things in or handling the food or stocking those items inside those cabinets. You're on mute. Oh, damn it. I want to add something. If the inmate is the one pushing the tray from production housing or whatever the receiving area is, they should be under escort the whole time. I mean, I see a lot of facilities where you go through all this check from the production area, right? And then now, okay, now we get ready to clear it. Uh, to get to the receiving area, and we just allow the inmate to take it off and push it directly to that location. Now, granted, what do I mean by escort? Okay, so let's just do it this way, because I know we're understaffed. I get it. So we may not be able to have the manpower to go ahead and have an officer assigned to every unit uh, that's going to get food delivered, but there should be eyes on them. You know, so if the inmate has to cross one area to the other, there should always be an officer that is that sees the inmate the inmate is in their view but having said that this should also be controlled like i i do agree with the fact that we don't want to start sending out inmates at different times to different locations because that makes it very hard for custody to keep track of who's going where i think that what should happen here is when the inmate if they do have it this way and the inmates leave in the production area what should happen is they should have an initial check-in point uh, with one of the officers that's going to be able to let the staff know, hey, be advised, such and such, such and such inmate is coming to your route with 30 trays, 40 trays, whatever it is. Uh, just so they know, again, there's eyes. Now, guys, I know this may not be possible for a lot of facilities. So granted, if it's possible, you know, if you can make it happen, make it happen. If you can't, I get it. It's just word of advice here. I've seen uh, when trays get pushed out, it's a very controlled effort. It's announced, let's say, at 1030, we're pushing trays out for lunch. So all the inmates line up, uh, and then all of a sudden, we clear them out to go. And when they go, the arcade officer can visually watch each inmate and where they're going. And by the time they venture into the unit and out of sight of the arcade officer, they're in sight of the unit officer. What I don't like is, okay, the trays are ready to go and send them as they're ready. Hold on, guys. Because I got too many inmates out going out in different locations. Let's keep this controlled. I got to get six units out there, whatever it is. So let's get the six inmates lined up right now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me announce to the North Compound. Hey, North Compound, we got six inmates going to these units. Get ready. Here they come. You watch them go. And then once they leave your site, they're in the unit. The unit sees them. Only because you don't want for any moment that inmate to be out of your vision because the moment they're out of your vision, then that first fail safe you had where the food was checked from uh, the production side, it's invalid. doesn't matter. That first check. And, and one last thing, Russ, I know you'll agree with this, Russ. Even though we have many fail safes, our job is always to protect that initial fail safe. If that makes any sense. You know what I mean? Our job is to always protect that initial fail safe. So I, and people are like, oh, don't worry. They're going to check it again uh, when it gets to the unit. No, 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 no. I, I don't like that. I want to treat it as if there are no fail safes, as, as if that's the final stop. Even though I'm, it's not, I want to treat it that way. Would you agree with that, Russ? Well, yeah, let's just go back to, you know, the old what, what is a fail safe? Okay, it's uh, or fail safes. It's just a series of links. Um, how weak is your weakest link? You know, how strong is your strongest link? It doesn't matter how strong that one link is. 
uh, if the one, you know, anywhere in the middle is, you know, broken, because at that point, we've already, you know, made sure that there's a way for them to, you know, leverage and exploit something that we're doing wrong. And they watch us all the time. So they're hip to whatever that's going to be. Yeah. And, and what's your thoughts real quick, just on that organized system of, of getting the inmates to the unit? Well, I mean, it's kind of hard to say because, you know, um, every facility right. being different, having different outlays and stuff, you do want to do it in a controlled manner. Um, so it's kind of really just dependent on that. I think, uh, you know, just make sure that you're doing things smart, you know, look at the way you're conducting it, try to find the holes in it, and then try and plug those holes. Yeah. And guys, again, that's if your facility can do it. I think the key here is that you got to have eyes. That's the key. Now, I want to mention something. For some facilities that do operate on the porters or the um, uh, runners, whatever it is, especially if you're in a close custody unit, uh, some areas may use lesser status inmates to go ahead and deliver the food. I want to make sure of one thing, guys. Please make sure your porters, your runners, go through all types of security checks before going into your unit. And what I mean by that is metal detectors and strips. Let's not avoid those strips. I know a lot of people, they get a little complacent and, oh, I worked with such and such for a while and, you know, he's good. He's good. No, guys, anytime an inmate comes in a port or whatever, and especially if you're working in those close custody units and you're getting those inmates from lower level statuses into those areas, they need to be stripped down. They need to go through every procedure. And I've seen some facilities say, well, it's hard when we do that because then we don't get a lot of inmates that want to take those jobs because they uh, don't want to go through that process. I don't care. Then force them to work. It's an operational need. You could force them to work. If they choose not to, you could charge them and, you know, take away whatever time or, or whatever privileges they have. The, the key is, guys, is that we cannot give the inmates an excuse to avoid those security concerns, especially uh, – the porters that are delivering food to those close custody units, you better be stripping them, pat frisking them, uh, going through the metal detector. I mean, I mean, am I am I right, Russ, with that? They should be going through every level of security. Well, yeah, you you would hope, but uh, once again, you know, there's so many different permutations possible. Let's just make sure that the main thing is is that we start clean at the end. Uh, that we account for that cleanliness in the middle and that you're clean all the way through. And what I mean by clean, of course, is free of contraband. Yeah, well, I do I do agree with this, though, Russ. Any inmate that works in a close custody unit that's been assigned there from a lower level unit, they need to be stripped and go through the whole security process before any level of interaction is done or they enter that unit. I mean, that's a big... Uh, that's a big, for, for me, that's a big, I know a lot of facilities uh, or a lot of places that may not find that as an active practice, guys, because maybe in their mind, it's inconvenient, not just for the inmate, but, you know, it does take staffing and it does take time. Um, but having said that, guys, uh, it doesn't become an excuse when shit hits the fan. And the first thing they're asking is, wait, did anybody strip the porters? You know, did anybody do any pat downs here? Did anybody, did they go through any metal detectors? So again, if you're a porter going from a lower level facility and you're working those close custody units, please make sure you're going through all those security measures. Because again, I know when shit hits the fan, the first question they ask are, are is those porters. Uh, you know, those, those porters is always a, a question that, that we hit as a concern because that could be the major part of where the contraband's coming in. Um, so we let me just get to the next part. Sorry about that. I've got to skip over to... Um, one of the things I thought that was good, just a little side note here. Russ could talk this down real quick. Once you get the food, you should try to deliver it as fast as you can because once the food starts getting cold, it could cause a group demonstration. A little bit of a sidebar dialogue, but Russ, would you agree with that, Russ? Food's a big concern sometimes. Yeah, you know, that's always one of my, uh, that's one of my things I always talk about when I talk about, you know, unity among inmates. We'd want to do everything we can to stop inmates from being unified. Uh, number one has got to be food. So, you know, let's make sure that we do everything we can not to give them an excuse, a reason, or a talking point to pull off some kind of demonstration. Yeah, and, and, okay, yeah, I just want, that was a little bit of a sidebar, just to let you know. So if you... Once the foods get delivered, I know sometimes they have the warmer trays, but uh, those always aren't as effective. So as soon as the foods get delivered to your unit, uh, as soon as possible, if you can get those delivered out, because one of the biggest concerns that can cause a group demonstration is, is food coming out and it being served cold. Okay, so I like this tip. This was a good tip. Um, 
Don't allow the runners or the porters, if they're the ones delivering the food, to pick the trays for each cell. How would you break that down, Russ? Uh, well, of course, you know, there's a there's a potential um, for that to go a couple different ways. First of all, you know, you don't want them introducing some type, some type of contaminant, some type of adulteration into the food uh, where, you know, something could, you know, make someone sick or they can, you know, uh, uh, complain later that, you know, that we allowed that to happen to them. Um, and specifically, I'm talking about especially inmates that are in some type of protective custody or someone that uh, has an active hit out on them. We don't want that to happen. Um, the other thing, obviously, we don't want to have happen is we don't want those trays or whatever's in them to be a chance for them to take and pass some sort of contraband, be it drugs, be it a weapon, be it a cell phone. Um, we want to try and diminish those opportunities as much as we humanly can. So that's um, that's the thing we want to watch there. We want to make sure that they are passing out trays and that they have no idea where any specific cart, any specific tray is going to. Now, granted, in a closed custody unit, I think we have more control of that in a full min unit or open dorms. I mean, even if we control that, it's going to be hard for us to keep track of trays being passed around. Um, but definitely in the closed custody unit, I think that's very spot on. I mean, we do have some level of control. I also want to add something else to that, Russ. Um, rotating the porters. Don't, don't allow them to get too comfortable. Um, you know, to me, uh, for our facilities, we usually have certain jobs that are six-month rotation, which means that uh, once the inmate's been there six months, we move them around and we keep moving them around. But also don't forget, if your unit is assigned uh, five or six different porters, you know, divvy up their responsibilities. You know, one day they get this area, the next day they get another area. And, you know, again, just you don't want to always keep them in the same area because the problem is it becomes expected. You know what was funny? It's kind of like working in an armored vehicle. I mean, sometimes we didn't know what route we were given. Like we understood the route, but we didn't know. Like some of us would know, let's say, 15 different routes. We would know them. Uh, but when we get to work, you know, we wouldn't know which route we were given that day, which could be good because we were planning something, you know, oh, we can't do it today, you know. So same thing here. If you have an inmate that is planning something, you know, and you get to, you know, give them different uh, locations, it's hard for them to find a consistent plan. But there is one concern, and I, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I could picture someone saying this for us. Well, if that's the inmate that's spreading the contraband, then he's spreading it everywhere. You know, it's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. But I, I mean, think you can always you can always look at it that way. Um, but that's part of the reason that you, you know, you take preventative measures. Um, you know, chances are guys aren't spreading it everywhere. Guys are spreading it to their homeboys. Guys are spreading it to those individuals that are in their particular STG. I'm not going to say that it's that it's not. Um, necessarily the case but i mean at some point you have to take some kind of measures so half measures just aren't as good yeah and guys as i said i agree with that russ that's really powerful i want to say that, guys even though um they're they're you're being assigned something different daily it's still not in a schedule like every five days this person gets this no it's when they come in this is what they're assigned and you know keep that random that's very important guys also uh russ mentioned this before kind of same thing but switch up where you start serving every day. Hey, Russ, any other things that you could do uh, to keep things rather uh, spontaneous to some extent? Um, you know, there there's a few things that you can do. Uh, obviously, that would be ideal. It's not necessarily possible just because of that um, way certain places are, are laid out. Uh, but, you know, we just want to try and be ahead of the curve and uh, break things up as much as possible. So there's less predictability as to how they can use an exploit against us. So uh, that's what I that's what I would start with. Um, you know, in some places, it's it's just not a feasible uh, tactic. So, but do try and think things through. You know, there's some of these places I can't envision enough to tell you. Oh yeah, this would be a really good idea. You can find that out on your own just by thinking it through. Yeah, and I do want to mention something else uh, real quick, a little side note. So sometimes what happens here is um, officers like to check the food, and sometimes people get wary when they see the officer going through the food. So sometimes if there's extra food and we count, let's say we got 40 inmates, but today I got 45 trays, I may randomly check 
the, maybe five, the five extra trades. So you don't know which five I'm going to randomly check thoroughly. I'm not going to serve those, but just to randomly be able to check randomly five and then just junk them. You know what I mean? It's okay. So I just took out five, put it here, and just junk them. Because, again, it's not about so much the contraband getting to the inmate, but also the knowledge of knowing is contraband coming into the unit. So, you know, having five extra one, okay, if I go through this, you know, okay, I may not want to give that to the inmate, but you don't know which ones I'm going to go through today. You know, you don't know which ones I'm going to go through. So having that five just to kind of check kind of keeps people on their toes because they don't know which ones you're going to check. So some facilities actually do that. They put out a few extra and then the officer takes a random few to go through them real quick uh, and just to keep things on the toe. I mean, it's not odds are you catching it still not, but but it, it's enough to keep people on their toes. And Russ, you mentioned be wary of containers that can hold liquid. Yeah, you know, um, if you're the one doing the passing out, in these units and you know you're approaching that that bean hole that cuff port that food tray slot whatever you want to call it um you know in these higher level institutions or 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 units you know make sure that inmate doesn't have you know stuff stocked up that he can approach you and splash you with you know um there's been times where we've had to you know go up and down those places you know with uh, shields and stuff because of the threat of being speared or the threat of being splashed uh, gassed, whatever you're going to call it. So, you know what, make them clean those things out. And then uh, also make sure that, you know, you can see the area around that food port, you know, skim it with your flashlight, make sure as the inmate approaches that he shows you his hands, right? Make sure that he raises them up so he doesn't have something hidden on his side. Because I mean, I've seen some long spears come through those uh, food ports and it's, it's scary. So, you know, make sure you do all of those things, especially in those uh, higher level units. Yeah. And, and Russ, I also want to add something else. Make sure, even though we're doing things randomly, like assigning certain areas to different inmates, if the inmates are the ones delivering the food or even walking the trays down, make sure we document, please, who did the deliveries that day or who brought the food trays down. Because I, I know for a fact, when shit hits the fan, they do the investigation. Some of the questions they're going to ask is, well, uh, who delivered the food from point A to point B and who, which porters delivered the food to the inmates? And I will tell you one thing. If by chance um, there is contraband coming into the unit, um, if you have to just, I know, guys, it is what it is, but if you have to remove all your porters and hire a fresh batch, you can always retrain them. Um, I would do it that way than to try to, you know, keep them on the job, not knowing which one. It doesn't matter. Hey, guys, I have contraband coming in. I got six porters. You know what? I don't know which ones it is. So you know what? I need a whole new batch. Oh, yeah, it just is messed up. Yeah, because they may even turn on each other because some may really want the job. So with that said, I'd rather just literally uh, to protect the facility, universal precaution, hire a new batch of inmates, and then put the other ones uh, either in some investigative housing, if that's the case, or if I can't find out who it is. Sorry, guys, you were fired. And uh, if you know anything, you know, reach out to me and maybe you can get your job back. I mean, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Is that is that how it rolls? Yeah, it's it's kind of dependent. You know, there's places that um, are equipped to do things like that, and others that aren't. But yeah, always always make sure that there's some type of documentation that takes place so that we have a way to trace things back. Hey, Russ, let me ask one more question before we come down to a close, because basically you're right. I, I know Russ was very good with the balance here because not all facilities. Um, can do some of these suggestions. I get it. We're understaffed and, you know, uh, you know, right now we're kind of, you know, doing things out of desperation, sad to say it's true. Uh, but if you could break down, Russ, some of the things that we should automatically be doing, regardless of being understaffed or not, uh, what are some of the things that we cannot slip on that we really truly have to be consistent when it comes to issuing those trades? Like there is no negotiation here. No, well, the number one thing is is making sure that there is nothing inside, around, on the inmate, or in the uh, thing that's uh, coming over. That's the number one thing that we can do. But the number two thing that we can do, of course, is think critically and act effectively. All the time, you should be playing that what-if game, right? That what-if game on the higher level involves that critical thinking skill where you're thinking about, okay, if I was an inmate... How would I beat my system here? How would I do that? You know, um, and there's ways to do it. You know, I used to watch all the time where uh, they were delivering things to the back gate area and we had inmates working outside 
And uh, those inmates would put things uh, in those pallets that were being delivered for inmates that were breaking down those pallets and things to come inside the institution. I mean, it's, it's simple, but critical thinking skills will put you ahead of those games. Yeah, and guys, one more thing. Supervisors need to do random spot checks as well. Uh, and guys, by the way, when I mean random spot check, don't call anybody and tell them that you're coming. Wait for them to start the momentum and go right on the unit and follow through because if there's something going on, you're going to catch it now. You know, I know a lot of people will go on right before they deliver the trays and it gives someone a chance to reinvent their game. But if you go on right when the game starts moving, you could catch any shifts. You know, so if there is something that's happening, you're going to catch it. But as again, you have some some supervisors like, oh, I'm going to do a spot check and they're waiting on the unit a half an hour before the trays are even being issued. It's like, hold on, guys. Everybody knows you're here. So if there's a game being played, you ain't you ain't going to catch it. What you got to do is you got to get there when it's running and then just tag alongside it and truly be a bit of a surprise. Would you agree to that, Russ? I mean, that that's key, right? We could do a whole show on that. Yeah, it's, but it's just, you know, the main thing is, is do those spot checks, but also, you know, have other people buy into the thought of having the spot checks done so that we can maintain fidelity over the entire course of that program that we just outlined for you. I like that. Hey, Rush, you have anything you'd like to say in closing? I thought this was a very good topic and compliments what William Young put out. So guys, get a chance. Check out Just Corrections YouTube. I'll just say this. Play that what if game. Think critically, act decisively, and make sure that you're finding the little cracks in the fidelity of the program that you're running, whatever it is, whether it's food or yard, whatever it is. You can apply this to all of that. Yeah, and guys, make sure whatever you give out, you get back. And also, if you could avoid it, those alum those aluminum lids, get rid of them. If you could do ju juices without the aluminum lids, because that's a great way for inmates to start fires. As always, guys, the show is Tear Talk. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you anytime I post up a video. Okay, wait, hold on. I just want to make sure we get Russ's smile before we go. Russ, can I get that smile one more time, sir? Yeah, this is my smile. And, yeah, because you got a 90-inch television behind you. I do. I'm, uh, later on, as soon as this is done, I'm going to watch Tear Talk on it. <laughs> All right, guys. As always, guys, stay safe, man.